This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. Semiconductors are the backbone of modern electronics, from smartphones to home appliances, MRI scanners, and satellites. Breakthroughs in semiconductors and microelectronics will be key to overcoming limits in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, manufacturing, and communications. All of these technologies need energy, and energy efficiency will be critical as they move forward to transform industries and make positive impacts on society. We are joined by Matthew Pinthani, Associate Professor, and Herbert L. Stiles, Faculty Fellow in Chemical Engineering at Iowa State University, where his research group is focusing on global challenges in the areas of energy production, utilization, and efficiency by developing materials with specialized optoelectronic characteristics. Professor Pinthani, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. So what uh, initially caught your imagination about chemical engineering? Were you always interested in how things worked? I get asked this question a lot. And uh, among chemical engineers, there sort of tends to be a similar story that when we were in high school, uh, maybe we sort of liked chemistry and we were good at math. And that was certainly the case for me. And we thought that, that a good way to combine those interests were uh, chemical engineering. So initially, I actually was considering biomedical engineering and I changed to chemical engineering because I thought that it would give me more options outside of the biomedical space than I could always move into the biomedical space afterwards. I think just before high school, I was really interested in how things worked, you know, not just chemically, but biologically, electrically, sort of end up choosing one of those interests moving forward. Where did that get into working with semiconductors and these kind of materials? The field that I work in is quite outside of maybe what typically chemical engineers work in, and semiconductor is especially focused on electronics and their those types of properties. Maybe another reason that I chose chemical engineering was because I was actually afraid of physics. You know, I, I thought that I wasn't good at it. I found it difficult when I was in high school. So I thought that going into chemical engineering would be a way to avoid doing physics. And I was wrong, first of all. There's a lot of physics in chemical engineering, I would say. In the chemical engineering curriculum, there's more physics than chemistry. So, you know, I didn't know any better. But as I took more classes in college, I had to take classes like circuits. And I took a microelectronics related class. And I started doing research in the areas of polymers, actually, polymer nanocomposites. And I started developing interests in nanotechnology because of that. Um, and I also started to develop interests in things like computing because of my coursework that I took related to different things. So I think that altogether that led me to pursue career paths or graduate school options that were in the area of nanomaterials and semiconductors. And I ended up joining a research group at the University of Texas at Austin for a graduate school that was focused on semiconductors. And my intention was actually to work on materials for computing. Uh, my graduate school advisor, Brian Corwell at UT Austin, um, at the time when he joined his lab was well known for silicon nanowires and he had some work thinking about making things like transistors and devices out of these silicon nanowires sort of for the purpose of understanding how does silicon work as you shrink it down to really small length scales at that time it was wasn't clear how small could we shrink transistors down on chips and nanowires were a way that we can get really small sizes well, it turns out that when I joined his lab, he had a different project that was related to solar energy that I joined. It was still semiconductors, but not related to computing. But eventually, as I went into my independent career, I started working on materials for computing. So that sort of explains a bit of my career arc. Before we get into the depth of the actual work itself, I want to ask you about electricity and why this work is important, why you might be interested in this. What kind of strain are tools like AI and quantum computers putting on the electric system? Why would you want to find more efficient ways to do some of that back end? Everybody knows right now that AI is in the news a lot, and it turns out that AI uses a lot of energy. We don't really see that. Like when we use our computers, we don't see maybe using AI. We don't know that we're using AI necessarily, but every time we do a Google search, for example, it is going through a language learning model that sort of interprets what we're saying and gives us an answer. Um, if you've ever done one of those CAPTCHA type things, you know, they ask you to recognize a crosswalk or something like that. We're actively training AI models to recognize things that could be used for something later. 
So we don't know that's what we're doing, but but that is effectively what we're doing. But it turns out to train AI models and to use AI, it t- takes a lot of energy. And most of this energy is being consumed uh, outside of our house. It's being consumed in data centers um, around the country. And what we're seeing is that this energy consumption of data centers is rising exponentially because of the interest in AI. That sort of motivates the need to come up with new strategies for computing that don't use as much energy, which meaning that they operate more efficiently. We use electricity more efficiently to do the operations, also consume uh, or waste less energy. A lot of processes, especially electronic processes, lead to production of heat. Um, Even running electricity through a wire, uh, you have some heating associated with that, um, especially as you shrink them down. So on computers, wires are really tiny, so that means you get a lot of resistive heating. So try to avoid uh, design computing components and materials that enable energy efficient computing, both from the standpoint of operation and and algorithmically. Can can we design things that could enable new AI algorithms? One of the ways you're doing that is using something called optoelectronics. And I think we need to define that. Yeah. So optoelectronics has two sort of components in it, right? Roots, uh, optical, meaning light and electronic related to electricity. So optical electronics broadly are materials that deal with interconversion between light and electricity. So a simple example would be something like a solar cell that absorbs light and turns it into a, an electric current. Sort of the opposite uh, of that would be a light emitting diode. Um, so if in that case, if you run current through a light emitting diode, that electricity gets converted to light and that shines out directly. Those broadly speaking are types of optical electronic devices. There are other ones too, but those are maybe the simplest ones to understand right now. Thinking about semiconductors as part of a computer, part of what's going on in the chip that you're, an average person isn't going to be that specific about, what would be the benefits of using a light circuit in that semiconductor? So right now, our paradigm for computing is electronics. So we have electronic switches. So basically, a processor on a computer, on your cell phone, in your tablet, whatever electronic device you have, um, has a, a central processing unit. Um, and that has tons of little transistors, maybe hundreds of millions or even billions of transistors, which are tiny little switches that allow you to do logic operations. Um, and these Transistors are also connected by little wires that that electrically connect them together. So a processor, you know, in your computer is about one inch by one inch, and you are fitting a billion or two billion of them on there. So the wiring that's connecting them is really, really tiny. So long ago, people sort of foresaw some problems in terms of scaling this down. There's this thing known as Moore's Law, where Gordon Moore, which was a a key uh, person in, in Intel, he sort of predicted that every couple of years, the number of transistors would double. You know, back in the early days, there was 1,024 uh, transistors on on some of the early Intel chips, right? So they predicted every couple of years that this number would double. But people sort of foresaw like that there would eventually be some problems. And one of them would be related to uh, just the energy consumption not scaling well. You could fit more things and you could do more operations, but the energy consumption would not scale down anymore in the same way. And there'd be problems with heating and things on chips. And people sort of, uh, researchers started investigating other ways um, starting in like the 80s. And one idea was co- it's called integrated photonics. So rather than using electricity to transmit data on chips or, or in, in computing systems is to use light. Um, so a parallel example to that is transmitting data over long distances, right? So we use fiber optic cables to transmit data all over the world right now really efficiently. Um, and before that, we had electronic data communication, similar to like our corded phone lines that we used to have. And we found that optical transmission is more efficient and allows you to transmit much more data in the same amount of sort of space in a wire and optical fiber. So we solved that problem over long distances. Um, we're able to have really efficient a fiber optic communication, but we haven't solved that problem very well on chips themselves. So we want to get that same sort of efficiency on chips, but it turns out that we don't really have the right materials that sort of satisfy all the needs that we need uh, to do that. So moving into your approach for making these kind of new materials in semiconductors, what are group four semiconductors? So this has to do with the periodic table. Group four refers to, if you look at the periodic table, it consists of sort of columns of atoms, and each of these people refer to as groups. So if you look over at the 14th row, 
Some people call it group 14. People will also call it group 4B. So in the semiconductor world, they shortened that to group 4. So that's the, the column at the top. It has carbon and below that silicon, germanium, tin, and lead actually all the way at the bottom. So lead that wouldn't be included in this group 4 for semiconductors, but um, the rest of those potentially could be included. So group 4 semiconductors would be semiconductors containing any one or a mixture of those elements. Part of your approach, I guess, is using zintel phase. What is zintel phase? For most people, with, even with a scientific background, a uh, rather obscure, unclear, uh, unheard of thing. So zintel phase is a, a interesting kind of chemical compound that consists of a combination of elements that's sort of unusual in nature that combines one far end of the periodic table, what we call the alkali or alkali earth metals, which is the first or second column, um, and metalloids, which are maybe include group four, but also the, uh, the the sort of neighbors around that. So we'd say group in semiconductor is group three and five, or or even the the ones for two and six. So those types of elements. It turns out that these sort of unusual compounds form interesting structures. In some cases, they form layered structures. So our approach here was to use a particular types of zintel phases that form layered structures where they sort of alternate between the materials such as like silicon or germanium and an alkali earth metal like calcium. So what happens is you form like a, a layer of silicon and a layer of calcium and it naturally spontaneously forms that at a single atom scale. And those materials as made are sort of metallic. But what we can do is use some chemistry to selectively remove the calcium atoms out of that. And we end up with a stack of individual silicon layers and those silicon layers are semiconducting. You can say they're two-dimensional silicon layers or nano sheets. These sheets of silicon have very different properties than normal silicon, including the ability to emit light, which normal silicon cannot. So we can use it as sort of a, a material that uh, is sort of compatible with silicon that potentially you can use with conventional microfabrication techniques that are made for silicon, but has very different properties that silicon and can enable things like light emission on a chip uh, that the current silicon can't do. And just said. Uh microscopic scale. Like, yeah. Like you said, stacks, atom stack. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So, so single atom thick layers or stacks of single atom thick layer uh, material. That's crazy. What is the biggest challenge with getting things down to that scale and working to make them functional? Yeah. So it turns out that they're very sensitive to everything that's sort of touching it or attached to it. So this is something that's always known for materials that there's in all of like material science we sort of treat the material like a, a continuum, but there's a surface where everything is interrupted. So if you take even a piece of glass or, or a piece of any material that you have, you sort of have a, a bonding that's yeah, that's in the material, sort of chemical nature, the arrangement of atoms and that dictates the properties of it. And that, that bonding is interrupted at the surface. In glass, that's silicon and oxygen primarily. All of a sudden, you don't have any silicon or oxygen to bond to anymore. So there is some interruption there, and that causes an interruption of that properties uh, at that surface. Usually, we don't see that or notice it because the material is so thick relative to the size of atoms. So as we shrink this material down to the single atom layer, the entire material is now a surface. Properties of this material will be sort of determined by what is bonded to the surface. So in the case of silicon, we, we make these stacks of silicon atoms. They're single silicon atom thick, but they're all bonded to one other atom. And it's very difficult to control what that atom is bonded to. And what we're finding out is that the properties can change dramatically depending on what is attached to each of those silicon atoms and the distribution like could be a, a variety of things. So controlling that and understanding how that results in different properties. So for example, in some cases, uh, the material will not emit light very well at all, or in some cases it can emit light very well. And understanding what is causing that is a big challenge, and then controlling that is another one. So bringing these concepts together, what difference, I guess, to efficiency would this method result in? You know, there's been a lot of people who've studied this from a theoretical point of view. So it depends on a lot of factors, but there's two types of efficiency or, or performance that we can talk about. One is like the energy efficiency. So depending on how we're able to integrate light into chips, you could see a factor of 10 or 100 in energy efficiency, some say. But also in terms of speed, one of the things that we saw with computing is that 
along with this idea with Moore's law that the number of transistors on a chip will increase, that the speed was also increasing every couple of years. And that sort of stopped in um, 2005 or so. The sort of clock speed of a transistor stopped. And that stopped because it's not possible to run it faster, but it just heats up too much if you run it faster. So the ability to use lights to manage some of these heat issues could potentially allow us to operate these chips much faster than even electronic components on the chips much faster than we're currently able to. When thinking about the heat dispersal, I guess, would you need to isolate the light elements? Would you need to introduce a different kind of layer to trap it or keep it running? So there's lots of areas of research that are dealing with how do you propagate light on a chip. So you don't just need to make it, that you also need to transport this on the chip somehow and then detect it somewhere else. Right. So if you consider the light a type of data or information, then you need to move that information somewhere and then read the information. So people are working at different levels on, on this. So there are things called waveguides that you can use to sort of direct light on chips. And that technology has been sort of developed somewhat, and that's a bit more straightforward. And even the detection part, you know, is not solved, but that is more solvable, I think, than the light emitting component. I see a guitar in your background, and there's been a, a number of people that, when they have music stuff, I like to ask about what role does music, creativity, the arts play in your other scientific work? That's a, a fun question. Um, the motivation for getting the guitar is actually from one of my grad students, right? He used to tell me every time he got frustrated, he would pull out his guitar and take a break, right? That maybe it sort of allowed him to reset you know, grad school, as many people who might be listening, who experience graduate school can be a really frustrating time at times, right? And sometimes taking a step back, doing something to sort of get your mind off of that helps. But also, I think, you know, the sort of creative aspect uh, of music is similar to some of the creative aspects of research, right? So it involves, you know, some principles and things like that. But, you know, a lot of it involves like inventing or creating so connecting those things together, you know, separately in your mind, maybe, you know, music can help. Give your brain a little distraction to engage in little different areas there. Yeah. Okay. So the last question for you today, what are the next steps in your work? Like I know your grant's ongoing and relatively early in the process there. So what are kind of the next steps in development? The grant that we have through NSF are, is focused really on material discovery. So in this sort of space that I was talking about, group four materials based off of zintel phases and understanding their properties. The steps beyond that, you know, how can we actually implement this into a real world application? So can we make some of the proof of concept devices that would be needed, like a light emitting device, rather than just a material that can emit light? Can we make this manufacturable? So one thing that we're doing, we're making little crystals of these materials. And really what we need to do is um, have materials put precisely exactly where we want them, you know, a million or even a billion times on a transistor with exactly the same properties everywhere, right? And so that's sort of what, what, what the standard is in the semiconductor world with electronics. And can we do that with these types of materials? And I think that challenge is not clear how that challenge will be solved. But uh, I think research is needed to ever use these technologies in real world. These are the types of challenges that will need to be overcome to be able to do that. Right. You're talking about having to sort out the ones that slightly don't perform the way you want and to do that on the scale that semiconductor manufacturing needs. Yeah. Yeah. Both are, both are performance, right? How they perform. And one of the challenges, how do you place the material exactly where you want that? And this is all oftentimes a problem with nanomaterials is that they have these amazing properties, but the conventional way we make micro products is we sort of are carving it out of silicon. So it's easy to define a device when you're carving it out of silicon. But if we're adding some material onto silicon, how do we know how it's precisely placed in the right place? How do we know the amount of material is exactly right? So people have figured this out over you know many decades of how to do this on you know very precisely in silicon, but can we do this with, with these types of materials? And it's unfair. Special thanks to Matthew Pinthani. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov. <laughs>